So welcome everybody. Uh, we'll start just before 3.35. <laughs> My name is Bernadine Dice, for those of you who don't know me, and um, Raj has to catch a flight soon after this talk, so I'll uh, start and keep this short. I'm very happy to introduce you to Raj Madhavan, who is a kindred spirit. Um, he wears many, many hats simultaneously and serially. So most recently, I can't keep up. Uh, he's the founder and CEO of Humanitarian Robotics Technologies, LLC. And he's also a distinguished visiting professor of robotics with the Amachi Labs at Amrita University. Um, so Raj has done many, many different things at Oak Ridge National Labs, uh, at NIST, and at the University of Melbourne. Um, but I think uh, what's most exciting for me at least, is his work in humanitarian robotics, and uh, so I'll let, you let him tell you about what he's been up to. Thanks. Okay. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Bernadine. Uh, Again, I should start by thanking uh, Bernadine for inviting me up here. And uh, as she said, um, we see a lot of things um, eye to eye. So it's, uh, it's been a good thing that I'm invited by her. So I, I'm very glad to be here. Um, I was here um, in 1999, 17 years ago. Um, I was a PhD student back then. Uh, but I've been written many times to Pittsburgh, but uh, officially I'm back on campus. So I'm thrilled to be here. Um, today. What I'll talk about is, uh, you see the title there, uh, and there are many loaded terms in the title itself, uh, for example, humanitarian and then the quality of life. So I will talk about those, uh, but just to give you um, uh, some idea behind some of these acronyms and some of the affiliations I have, the LLC is very new. It's uh, in fact uh, three weeks old. So there is a website, but I haven't even put it there because there's no content there. Uh, then I also have this visiting professor position in India. Um, and I recently, well not recently, maybe two years ago, I started this group called uh, Special Interest Group on Humanitarian Technology. I'm also interested in technology and public policy issues. So the three affiliations I have listed are rather four. I'm going to talk about each of those topics. So my, my talk has three parts to it. Uh, first one is going to be obviously the central thrust of the talk, which is the humanitarian robotic side of things. Uh, then I'll talk about the work we're doing under site and also the technology and public policy issues. Um, to formally introduce myself, uh, in addition to the existential nature of that question, uh, so I, I won't go through each and every one of those, but I, I really want to outline uh, a, a fact which kind of has pushed me into this humanitarian domain. I started working, uh, well, I worked for two government labs uh, with industry support, and then I worked at the university. So these three entities have a lot of good things, and at the same time, there's also several things that I did not like personally. Um, and I, I think the right word to use is I became increasingly disillusioned uh, with being involved in any of these entities, uh, and I'm not um, trying to offend anybody, it's just my personal opinion. Uh, and I, I felt like this is not something for me. And also, um, I have grown more and more, uh, or gravitated more and more towards this humanitarian domain because I want to do something using technology for good. So that's sort of the broad theme I'm interested in. So uh, in attempting to, that ans to answer that question, uh, I will say, um, Oh, there it is. So I would call myself a humanitarian technologist and roboticist. So um, what is that? We'll, we'll see what that exactly means. Um, before I really go into explaining um, what the humanitarian and all those terms I talked about, um, I want to spend a little time, I won't dwell on this, but uh, the reality of robotics, and this is uh, a famous article after referenced, uh, this is by uh, Bill Gates, uh, came out in 2007, a robot in every home. Uh, really, we haven't seen anything like Rossi in our homes. I mean, that's really not happened. Um, several reasons why, uh, well, we will see. Uh, and most, more recently, in 2013, uh, a similar question was posed to, to him. And then he put robot squarely as the first thing in his list of things that he think would make a huge difference. So r robots are you know, left, right, and center. Uh, pervading every aspect of our life these days. And a lot of the thinkers, Bill Gates definitely I would classify as a thinker, um, also think that they are about to make a huge difference in our lives. And they are here. They are here to stay. Uh, but we really haven't seen them at the level of detail or at the level of interaction that we would like to see. And uh, why is that? 
Well, um, I would attribute some of that to this, which I call a Hollywood problem. Um, we have seen many movies. Uh, there have been three or maybe four now, maybe five Terminator series. Uh, so in, in Terminator 1, for example, uh, the main character uh, comes as somebody who tries to kill the kid. And then in Terminator 2, the same model, mind you, comes back as the savior. So there's huge confusion right there, okay? Now, Hollywood, I would give them this. They have made life for a roboticist like me uh, somewhat easy in the sense it's made robotics sexy and cool. It's very easy to start a conversation with robotics because people have all these visions in their mind. They've seen these movies and from Wally to whatever else. Uh, it's very easy to start a conversation, but at the same time, it's made it very, very difficult for a roboticist because uh, people's expectations are so high, uh, unrealistically high. Uh, and as a roboticist, and many of you in this room uh, can attest to, um, we are really not there at the level of uh, functionalities and at the level of detail that Hollywood uh, uh, puts their movies. So I, I would say take um, but this is probably preaching to the choir here because you're all in the Robotics Institute. Uh, the, uh, take everything not just with a grain of salt, I would say even a cube of salt, you know. It's just, um, it, uh, there's a lot of disconnect and uh, one of the main reasons in my opinion is because we haven't seen as many uh, applications of robotics that really affects people in a day-to-day -day basis in a positive way. We really haven't seen that. There are other exciting things happening from the self-driving cars to a lot of UAVs flying around, um, which is also another thing I'm going to come back to. But we really haven't seen this, and there's this huge disconnect. Who is to blame? I'm not here to play the blame game, but I think all of us technologists hold some level of responsibility in terms of um, having this disconnect between what the reality is versus what uh, people's expectations are. Now, I'll, uh, I said I'll talk about what I mean by humanitarian. I think it's important to define because people have different views of what humanitarian means. So this is a straight up uh, dictionary definition. Uh, so humanitarian, this is a Webster definition. It says here, having concern uh, to improve the welfare and happiness of people. And uh, uh, I put it in other ways, it's uh, the alleviation of suffering. So happiness is the, the central core of any humanitarian enterprise. Uh, if you look at um, what's called as the quality of life index, and this is put out by this uh, economist intelligence unit, they have these uh, nine factors that they look at and uh, they try to gauge uh, how well people think their quality of life is or should be, and they publish a worldwide ranking of countries. Um, Denmark uh, very often uh, figures in the top of the list, sometimes it's first. I can tell you, I have a lot of Danish friends, they are not happy. <laughs> so um, it's a very subjective index, and these factors themselves are subjective, and um, how people answer, and then it's based purely on the survey, and uh, so there is some mismatch there, uh, or maybe there's something I don't understand. And then there is this World Happiness Report that the UN puts out. Um, the last two, it, it's, uh, it comes every other year. So there was one uh, published in 2015. Uh, and then they uh, measure happiness based on the traditional GDP measure. Um, is that the right way to do it? I'm not sure because I'm going to talk about Bhutan in a little bit where they're actually the country's wealth is not measured in terms of GDP, but in measured in terms of what's called as gross national happiness. Um, so this is again somewhat of a subjective index, um, depends on um, the view of the beholder. Uh, then there is this thing I subscribe to as a, as a Buddhist. Uh, this again goes to the core of uh, the definition of happiness. Happiness is that something you can bear with ease, suffering is something you cannot. So happiness tends to be at the core of humanitarian, um, the, the definition of humanitarian, uh, any, any effort you want to do. So I, I would say, uh, and this is my definition of humanitarian, so if technology, and the, which in my case happens to be robotics and automation, if that technology can somehow make people happy and alleviate suffering, then that is humanitarian for me, okay? So that's the first uh, thing I wanted to say. Then we go into what is humanitarian robotics and automation. Now that's uh, using humanitarian causes or robotics and automation for humanitarian causes, trying to alleviate suffering. That's quite straightforward. But there are some uh, clear distinctions, at least uh, um, in my mind. Uh, now, 
When I say humanitarian robotics and automation, obviously, uh, it goes without saying this should be for constructive purposes. This should not be for destructive purposes, and that's obviously something I subscribe to. Uh, then there is this uh, deploying these technologies in underserved and underdeveloped parts of the world, so that's, that's one aspect of it. Uh, there's other distinctions, so uh, as opposed to a purely research type effort where your focus is more on contribution to science, uh, in my view, again, the work I do, uh, I'm solely focusing on applied systems type work. So take something that exists, theory, methodology, framework, technology, whatever you want to call it, uh, can you put that together for the benefit of humanity in an applied systems way? So we're really not developing anything new, and I don't want to. Can you just bring things together that are already existing, put them together, and make them do something useful? Then, So that's a big distinction. Uh, then there is this uh, quality of life versus uh, standard of living, and you saw the quality of life in my title. Um, these two terms, unfortunately, uh, are being used interchangeably, and there is a big difference. Now the, the difference I would say, and I'd like to say this in, in, by way of an example, and that is, let's say you drive a Toyota, right? Uh, it'll be nice to drive a BMW, okay? So as you go from a Toyota to a BMW, yes, you arrive in style, handling is better, acceleration is better, or whatnot, but you get there, it's okay. So that's something you need to remember, but the standard of living improvement is going from, going, it's like going from a Toyota to a BMW. Whereas quality of life um, is, think about a place where is, there is not only hot water, there is no water, let's say. People sometimes have to walk miles. Of course, this is not the case in, in uh, most of the communities, but several communities are like this. So if the robotics and automation that I'm talking about, the humanitarian type of things, can make a fundamental difference in improving people's lives, thereby elevating the quality of life, that's the realm I want to be involved in. That's, that's where I would like to work on. That's the work I'm doing. Uh, the other important thing is sustainability. Obviously, you need to have a solution that just doesn't work one off. Uh, you need to have something that is put in place, and when the so-called expert leaves, uh, you need the things to work. So it's very important, and this is a little bit of an uh, engineer's arrogance, if you will. People try to go to communities and say, okay, I'm the super slam guy. What can my super slam algorithm do for you? That's the wrong question to ask. You always have to come up, instead of a top down, you have to come up at a bottom up approach, where you first understand the needs of the uh, community, the requirements of the community, then being the super slam person, who or he or she is, then you have to try to solve the problem using your skills as it applies to that community. And this is the only way it will also economically and um, financially sustain. So that's th these are some things you already might know, but I, I just thought for completeness I should bring that up. So there are several domains. As you can expect, uh, humanitarian robotics and automation can make a huge difference. The one in the blue ones are the ones I'm going to talk about uh, across different countries. Uh, there are also other things I'm peripherally involved or I think um, uh, some of the work we are doing can be extended to these and those are the animal anti-poaching type things to agricultural type uh, robotics to healthcare type robotics. So I used to work in this urban search and rescue domain when I was at NIST, uh, the National Institute of Standards and Technology. So here, urban search and rescue uh, necessarily does not mean uh, you're sending a robot to extricate the victim. That's really not the goal. It's more as an aid, as a tool for a responder who is, say, looking for um, a, a victim in a collapsed a rubble type scenario. Somebody's there. Can you use tools? Can you provide tools for the responders? Or can you provide tools for the people who are going to really do the work? Can robotics act as a tool to help them do their job better, efficiently, in a timely manner, so that you can save uh, lives? So I won't dwell too much on this, except that I want to say that uh, UGVs, unmanned ground vehicles in use are, are, you know, there's a lot of work that has been done across Japan and the US, uh, many other places. This is something I have done some work on, but I'm not going to go into this because most of the work I do these days are in this domain, uh, the so-called UAVs or uh, drone domain. Uh, the drones, uh, uh, just uh, quickly, uh, the two center pictures you see, it could be like a fixed wing or the ubiquitous uh, uh, quadrotor type uh, um, 
commercially available drones uh, are, are the norm these days, uh, used for different purposes, have different advantages and disadvantages. Uh, battery life is one of the critical things, uh, which I think uh, over time will solve, uh, solve itself. But uh, the reason I put that market overview is it's projected to be a $20 billion industry by 2020, so that's not that far away. Uh, it's supposed to hugely, uh, you know, uh, 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 a domain that's supposed to grow so huge, and if somebody wants to really make some money, really, and that's really the space to be in also. Um, the UN um, also has this agency called the OSHA, uh, and they have recognized the use of UAVs, and they have used UAVs in humanitarian response, and there is a document that exists, basically it's like a guidebook that goes through how you can prep your vehicles to how you can operate safely, and this has been done. And we use this as a guidebook in the, in the things I'm gonna talk about. So the first uh, application of uh, UAVs that I want to talk about is in Brazil. Um, so uh, you can see, um, I, I wish I had a pointer, I think I have one. Um, I don't. Um, so if you look uh, in this area, so this is the, uh, the, the highlighted blue area, that's the Rio Grande do Sul, which is in the southern part of Brazil, uh, bordering with Uruguay. Uh, and in that place, there is a lagoon called the Patus Lagoon, which uh, periodically floods. So when you have floods, obviously you have uh, the common problems of infrastructure damage to people being displaced. But also this has, tends to be a very uh, ecologically sensitive area. There are a lot of uh, local um, indigenous animals that also get affected. So you have both the human angle, but also you have this environmental slash ecological angle also. So we are trying to tackle this problem uh, by working closely with the uh, local government and also the local communities. Um, and pictures like these are becoming more and more common. Um, we have been having floods in Texas, so it's no different than that. Entire communities submerged underwater, all kinds of things are becoming more and more commonplace these days. Um, so what we do is, so this is joint work with uh, the University of Federal Rio Grande do Sul, UFRGS as it's called. Uh, I'm actually working with uh, hydrologists. So typically what hydrologists do, um, uh, they use a lot of GIS or a lot of satellite image type data. Now. Satellite image data is good, but there are some real um, uh, disadvantages when you try to apply it to a problem like this. Uh, the main ones are that the data, the satellite data, the GIS data you get, is actually of not sufficient resolution to plan anything useful on it. Uh, so it tends to be of course resolution. And also, the other major different, uh, um, drawback, and I've listed a few there, uh, is that the data is not available on demand. So you cannot command the data, you, do, you cannot say, I want the data now, can I get it? No, you cannot. You need to either wait for the satellite fly over, or sometimes you can have dedicated satellites. So the time could range anywhere from eight hours to 24 hours, 24 hours is the typical flyover. Uh, so it's really not on-demand data. So what we have done is, to circumvent these, these issues, um, our work focuses on um, existing models, regional models, GIS models, and then we use the drone data, treating that as a coarse resolution data, uh, rather the satellite is the coarse resolution data, then we send the drones where we want to get high resolution data, then we fuse them. So once you fuse them, you use the advantages of having the uh, satellite data over a larger area with a very much more focused, smaller, but high resolution on-demand data, then you really can act on it, and that's at the sufficient level of uh, detail that can enable any of the uh, responders who are trying to act on that data. So it becomes actionable. Uh, and I also should mention that we are not developing a full end-to-end -end solution, uh, but we are more interested in sort of being behind the scenes, trying to provide the responders. And this is an underlying theme in all the work we do. We are not never the face of the disaster. We're not st trying to steal anybody's glory, and that actually really works for us because they they can do whatever they want, but they're getting the information they need, and we get satisfaction in the fact that it's working and it's, it's enabling to save lives or making a difference. So we provide them with this uh, high resolution uh, um, GIS uh, UAV data, uh, and then that enables them to do uh, many things. And I mentioned I work with the hydrologists, uh, so I'll show in the next slide. Uh, with the hydrologists, as the name implies, they deal with anything that deals with water, right? So 
they use this uh, satellite data for uh, predicting floods, or even if there's a flood happening, then they can predict the trajectory of the river, let's say, and they can say downstream, these are the uh, things that it's going to affect, these are the communities that are going to be uh, in, in jeopardy. Or uh, from a prevention viewpoint, you can uh, say, if this river overflows, these are the uh, communities that will be affected. So you can work both in a response and recovery phase, which is after the disaster has happened or as the disaster is happening versus a sort of a mitigation phase where you can really take some proactive steps before the disaster really strikes. There are disasters like hurricanes, for example, they're just going to come, they're going to wreak havoc. You really cannot do, you cannot build a wall or anything. It's going to happen. So you really have to deal with them in the response and recovery phase of things. Um, and the work we are doing in this merging uh, putting that in a web GIS, working closely uh, with the communities uh, and uh, the disaster management practices that we are advocating. It's a first for Brazil, as far as I know. There aren't really, uh, my partners also tell there aren't any, uh, there is a national defense uh, uh, agency, Filmer to FEMA, which deals with it, but it's not really been that successful. So this is being run as a pilot program, um, and hopefully this will translate at the national level, and that's, that's where we are going with this. Now, um, I mentioned hydrological modeling. So uh, some of the things you can do, um, the, so ones, the one you see on the flood, uh, not flood, the one on the left you see is a fl flood risk GIS uh, thing you can generate with areas of low and high risk. And then when you fuse that with uh, UAV type data, then you can get a land cover, as they call it, land cover mapping data. And then that can be used, and this is of course not when a flood is happening, this is in a nice benign situation. Uh, these are the type of things we can get. And then we, as I said before, we can assist the local governments in trying to uh, plan their operations more effectively. Uh, now, the UAVs can also be used, I mentioned, uh, so the picture on the left uh, is basically showing uh, a trajectory of a river. Uh, these are overlaid on something like Google Earth. And you can really see, uh, or you can at least show um, in, a, in a visual form, what type of things are flowing through what, what type of towns, if you will. So you can really plan, plan on this, and th this gives them some <laughs> idea. Uh, the one you're seeing on the right, and this is for relocation monitoring, and uh, what, what you're seeing here in green, uh, so this is, um, this is like a refugee camp, or it's really not a refugee camp, but it's a camp where people are located because of the displaced flood situation. And this is not like your Syrian refugee crisis type uh, 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 camp, but it is a camp nevertheless. So the, the areas in green are basically are areas where uh, the supplies have reached the people on time uh, or they have sufficient supplies. The, the ones on the red you kind of see at the bottom are the areas that uh, could use the supplies. They haven't really got to them and that's because the entry point is from the other side. So now by looking at this from an aerial view we can really see okay these people are not getting the supplies because by the time they enter and come through here everything goes away. Uh, everything gets taken off. So then what you can now do is you can try to come this way so then these people get what they really need. So these kind of aerial view type uh, representations are very, very helpful uh, for people to better coordinate their, their operations. Um, switching gears, I'll talk a little bit about um, Bhutan. Um, for folks who don't know where Bhutan is, um, so Bhutan is a, um, it's a landlocked country, three sites surrounded by India, and in the north um, is the Himalayas, really it's Tibet, but um, Tibet is now China, eff effectively. Uh, no offense to the people in the audience who are Chinese. Um, the, uh, um, the beautiful thing about the country, and I visited, and that's me in a, a traditional costume. Um, the beautiful thing about the country is that, as I mentioned before, they talk about this gross national happiness, but there are so many several things it, uh, that make it very, very unique. So one of the things I would mention is 70% of the country actually has to remain forested at all times. Um, so you cannot just cut a tree and start building houses. There is a very lengthy, deliberately delayed process that people have to go through before they can even construct a house. And the houses have to be constructed in certain ways. Um, so there are many, many things uh, of this nature. Now, one of the, um, I guess, the bad things um, is I mentioned on the north of uh, Bhutan is, is the Himalayas. The Himalayas, uh, what happens is you have glaciers, and when these glaciers melt, they form what's called as glacial lakes. So it's still at a higher altitude, but not as high altitude as the glaciers. And when the glacial lakes melt, 
you get uh, rivers that flow gently downstream. Uh, and in fact, Bhutan uh, generates hydroelectric power from this, and it's been very, very beneficial for them. But then the very uh, benevolent rivers also sometimes, when the glacial lakes break, uh, start to overflow. And that re results in this uh, process called gloves, or this uh, phenomenon called uh, gloves, uh, glacial lake outburst floods. And that's exactly it. The glacial lake bursts, and you have a deluge of water. Uh, millions of gallons of water just come, come down in a very short amount of time. And uh, you cannot see the one on the bottom, but the red dots basically show on a map of Bhutan uh, some of these uh, um, glacial high-risk lakes that have been identified, and there are quite a few of them. Um, I want to switch here and show uh, a quick video. It's a long video, but I'm going to stop it halfway and then talk on the other side about exactly what we have done for this problem. The Kingdom of Bhutan lies at the southern tip of the Tibetan Plateau. Until the 1970s, the borders of this Buddhist country were close to outsiders, helping to preserve their traditions amid the swirl of a modern and industrialized world. For centuries, the Bhutanese, like their Tibetan and Nepalese neighbors, have lived off the land. Farmers and herders are all sustained by the glacial waters, which the locals refer to as white gold. Bhutan, like most other countries within the Hindu Kush region, is harnessing the meltwater to create hydroelectricity, which generates much needed energy and revenue for the kingdom. But the very same glacial meltwater that sustains the kingdom is threatening to destroy the villages and farmlands that line its rivers. The Himalayan meltdown is creating hundreds of high-altitude lakes which contain massive amounts of water. At any moment, an earthquake or avalanche could trigger a glacial lake outburst flood, obliterating all in its path. among the most feared natural disasters throughout the Himalayas. It's red. Well, I think I'll stop there. I'll just talk a little bit here. Um, it's a long video. I can make that available if anybody's interested. Um, so the, as you can see the devastation in terms of the amount of water that comes in a very short period of time. So the way they deal with it right now um, is they have this uh, flotation devices. Basically, think of your toilet uh, flush uh, mechanism, right? Uh, when the water level goes above a certain level, and if uh, the, uh, the float flotation device reaches a certain threshold, then it triggers audible alarms, and then people have to move to higher ground. But then we are really talking. Uh, they measure it at the very high point. Also, even then, we, what we're talking about, the amount of the response time you have is in the order of hours. Now, that's, you can only do so much in, in terms of infrastructure, protecting the infrastructure damage, or moving just to higher ground cattle and, and people. Um, now, the solution is, uh, one possible solution, I must say, is uh, we can uh, send UAVs up to the glacial lakes because we know the lakes are the ones that are bursting. And you don't have to do anything fancy. You don't even have to measure the level of water. All you have to do is uh, go there, take a series of pictures uh, of the lake, the periphery of the lake. So you do one today, and perhaps go back tomorrow or at a predefined set of times. Then you have two sets of images now, and all you have to do is uh, change detection. Then you can say, uh, a trained eye, like a geologist, for example, can see that the rupture is about to happen uh, along these uh, walls of the lake. That's all you need to know then. Now you've gone from uh, a window of a few hours to a window of perhaps a few days. So that makes a huge difference. So this is something we are working on. The other thing, Bhutan, I mentioned the 70% land cover. Uh, poaching is becoming a huge problem. A lot of the animals are being killed, the indigenous animals, and then being sold in the black market. Uh, though UAVs um, can also um, serve as a, as a natural deterrent. And in terms of the canopy, the tree canopy, it can also do a lot of mapping to keep track of environmental um, type of effects on these, on these uh, natural, um, natural regions. So 
I like the UAVs and I think there are several beneficial things that UAVs can do uh, and they, they do do already. Uh, but of course, as we know, uh, things can also uh, go in the other way and uh, as with any technology, there's a good way to use it, there's also a not so good way to use it. Now, um, okay, I already talked about that. Uh, now I'm gonna switch gears a little bit and talk about this competition that we have organized through this uh, group called uh, Site, uh, Robotics Art Mission Society, many of you know, I'm not gonna talk about that. Uh, the uh, site was formed uh, in 2012, we were the first one, and the mission and the vision statements are very similar to what I have been talking about, but our emphasis has been on these uh, so-called HRATCs, our Humanitarian Robotics and Automation Technology Challenges. Now these challenges are framed in two ways. Uh, well, they're all, they have, a common underlying um, um, uh, goals, but they're framed in two ways, and I'll talk about that. The problems are not only purely technical in nature, that, okay, technology can solve this problem. Okay, that's really one aspect of it, but really we need to, I talked about this engineer's arrogance, as I said before, um, how can we really involve the community? How can we come up in a bottom-up fashion? So many of the cultural, socioeconomic factors are, are also very, very important, uh, right from the design phase, right from when you're trying to gather requirements phase, uh, not down the line when you have designed a prototype, that doesn't really work. So you need to really take into account these things right from the get-go. And uh, we do several things um, in propagating viable solutions, and one of the uh, aspects or one of the ways it has worked really well is through these challenge type environments and that's uh, what I'll talk about. We also fund some small projects, I'll talk about those too. Um, so we have done these uh, landmine clearance uh, competition for two years. There's a third one happening at Acre this year. Uh, the why is very easy because the uh, landmine skill uh, an inordinate number of uh, people, but the point I would like to emphasize is it's just not just the loss of life or people losing limbs and children uh, dying and losing limbs. That's, yes, that's a problem. It would be nice to solve it. But there is also another humanitarian angle to this, and that is if you clear these landmines in a, an environmentally friendly way, then these lands are perfectly good agricultural lands. So people not only have to lose lives by walking on them, but in fact they can grow crops, uh, they can, it becomes a means of sustenance also. So there, it's a two-pronged uh, benefit, and people only always talk about loss of lives, but there's also um, more uh, important humanitarian angle, and that is also important uh, in the sense that there are solutions, there are like $50,000 to $100,000 solutions. There's one solution, uh, proposed by the US Army, and it's this huge Oshkosh truck, uh, it's a $100,000 solution, literally. Uh, they drive it over the infested area, if you will, and they blow up all the mines. So now, yes, of course, the land is cleared, but the land is useless now. Uh, from a remediation point of view, all these things have blown up, uh, and then really, it's not arable land anymore. You really cannot do anything with that. So you need to always think about, uh, at least I like to think about, solving is one thing, but solving in an environmentally friendly community uh, uh, friendly ways is very, very important. So there have been some crazy uh, type of solutions with uh, radar and rats. It's apparently, it apparently costs $3,000 to train a rat uh, or a rabbit, or that's actually a rat, that's not a rabbit. Um, and uh, yes, if they blow up, nobody cares, that's, that's fine. But then the communities we are talking about are at the base of the pyramid looking at $2 or $5 a day type of uh, communities and you propose a $2,000 solution there, that's really not what you want to do. So what we focus on uh, is this, uh, in this competition is landmine detection and classification. So it's again a two-step problem. First one is you reliably have to detect where the mines are and then once you know reliably, and you can get there without getting yourself blown up, then you can really extricate the mine. So that's not the real issue. The real issue is really finding it where it is. So what comes out of our competition is like in a gridded structure, you get an XY of where the mine is with uh, some confidence measure. Then either you can send a robot to extricate the mine or it can be a manual um, um, operation too. Uh, we have a scoring metric, anyway. So the, the interesting thing about this conference, uh, not conference, this uh, competition, is that it, uh, it's a very low barrier, and the way that comes about is you have this three phases we do this in a simulation phase, a testing phase, and a real final phase. In the simulation phase, people develop algorithms uh, in a high fidelity simulator, and then we give them a testing uh, venue, which is actually in Portugal, um, in Coimbra, and then uh, people test their algorithms on a real robot, 
uh, and that's uh, that was donated by ClearPath. Uh, you probably saw that in the last slide. I put the thing, and it was also part of this uh, EC-funded project called Tiramisu. Um, and um, in the testing phase, they get the data files, they get the video files, they really know how their robot is doing uh, based on their algorithm. Then we move on to the finals phase, uh, where um, it happens at ICRA, and this will happen in Stockholm in about a month. Uh, people sit in a room, the robot is still in uh, Portugal, we run the code given by the teams and it's, everything is beamed through a YouTube channel, that's how it works. So it's extremely low entry barrier because people don't have to buy the robot, don't have to instrument it with sensors, they don't even have to travel, you can do that in, from the comfort of your cubicle. So that's really um, um, gotten good response and we typically get 15, 15 teams this year we got 14 teams then it kind of got down selected to testing to 10 and now we have ended up with about four teams in the final uh, there's some more information here one quick thing I want to point out so the way the robot works is you, you put it on that robot and it, it scans parallel to the ground it's a metallic uh, uh, detector a coil inductive coil type mechanism uh, so it picks up metallic content and then it will beep and then you filter it through your algorithms then you know given the location of the robot with GPS or without GPS then you, you know exactly where the uh, the mines are now this is sort of the mock-up uh, mines we, we use uh, it doesn't explode per se uh, but one question I always get is uh, the lot of the buried mines, the unexplored ordnance, uh, is plastic. Uh, so how do you detect pla plastic stuff because you're using a metallic detector? So that's a question we get quite often. Uh, the answer to that is the the firing pin, the detonation mechanism, actually is metallic. So even in a plastic explosive, there is metal, so you still can detect metal and be reliable. Uh, and then folks come to the finals and there's some prize money. Uh, we have written uh, articles in the uh, Robotics Automation magazine. Uh, so this is good for students because they really like it. A, they don't have to spend so much money. And some courses, uh, uh, some universities, for example, uh, University of Texas Austin, made this as part of their curriculum and they gave them credit. So it's actually working not just as a, your extracurricular activity, but it's actually part of the curriculum. Uh, and people like it because um, students uh, work on a realistic problem that's benefiting humanity. It's a huge thrill for them. Now, another interesting thing I want to point out is so this, these are our finalists. So you see Team Orion, which was the University of Texas at Arlington team, which was the winner in the first year. Now, uh, the nice thing we do with this competition is everything is open source. It's freely available. So if a new team comes in the second year, they already have a set of code that's already working that actually is the winner's code which will you just download and you, it will run but what they did was they took Tim Orion's team uh, and they put their magic sauce on it and uh, what really happened was they ended up beating NUS National University of Singapore ended up beating Orion at their own game in a way of speaking so they placed first and Orion ended up second last year so this is a very good way of progressing technology without having to reinvent the wheel or people spending time trying to develop some try to develop something from scratch so progression is really fast and where we are going with this is we are in talks talk with uh, UN uh, within the UN there is something called the United United Nations Landmine Clearance Center uh, they do a lot of work in this area as the name implies we are hoping that we will come up with something like a black box a black control box that can mount on any moving platform then we'll do the detection and classification uh, reliably we hope we can get the price down to five hundred dollars and our hope is this will be disseminated widely and we will see a wide reduction a drastic reduction in terms of the landmines in the world that's where we are going purely driven by the students uh, and uh, if it succeeds it will be all the uh, credit will go to the students. Um, we also do something a little bit differently. So for the landmine clearance problem, we found the problem and then we asked the community to solve the problem. So we kind of turned that around and we did this thing, which is we said, okay, we'll give you a little bit of money. Actually, it's really a little bit of money. Uh, uh, deliberately so because we want everybody to feel some ownership in the problem. So we ask them to pair with the foundation, uh, perhaps with uh, some community-led initiative. So everybody puts some money, so everybody feels some accountability. Uh, so that's why it's deliberately low. But then we 
as opposed to the landmine problem, we ask the communities or as the proposers to come back and tell us this is a problem that's worth solving for this community with input from this community. And when solved using a robotics automation approach, it'll make a huge difference for the community. So we work both ways. We sometimes, if we think the problems are good, we kind of go to the community. We're also receptive in terms of receiving ideas from the community. There will be a second call uh, this summer, so if you are inclined, uh, I encourage you to submit something to this. Uh, these are two projects that we have, we were ongoing last year, I won't talk too much, and then this year we funded a few of those that are listed here. Uh, the list is growing, so first year, last year was the first year, this year we're growing, I'm hoping it'll just only get better. And where we're really going with this is we hope in all these communities, the people who are doing their projects, um, sort of become mentors. So if there's another team from the same region, we can kind of pair with them and make them work together. So we're also trying to do some matchmaking there. Um, now I'm going to switch to my last part of my talk, and I'm going to try to go through in about five minutes or ten minutes. Uh, technology and public policy. This is something I'm really interested in, um, and I'll quickly step through this. Uh, so this is a very hot, hot topic. Uh, very much uh, part of the national psyche these days, uh, but there is contradictory and confusing information for the public. They're saying robots are coming, they're gonna take the jobs away, and uh, in extreme cases, there, there are cases where we are all apparently slaves to robots. There's all kinds of uh, views out there. Um, and, but you look at the literature, robot, robotics is growing, and people say robotics is good. And I'm, I'm not taking any sides here. I'm trying to be as objective as I can, though I, I'm a roboticist, I think robots are good. Um, so then the other um, extreme is you, you get these books, uh, and then there's all these kinds of things. But then the, the picture like that, I mean, robots are gonna rule and humans are gonna be their slaves. I mean, that's, at least we are not there, because we all know as roboticists, it's just, it's just not, happening, will it happen in my lifetime? I don't think so, but we will see. Now the, the effort, um, basically what it's doing is it's trying to involve, um, so in, in, the, in the Congress there's something called the Robotics Caucus, uh, chaired by a Democrat and a Republican congressman. We've gone in front of them to make a case. Uh, this was well received, this was a little bit old, and uh, this uh, public policy thing actually came out of uh, uh, that. Uh, the other uh, thing is autonomous self-driving cars, right? I mean, pretty much every manufacturer now has some kind of a version of self-driving car. Google, of course, uh, is well known. Tesla recently came out, and Audi has it, Mercedes has it, everybody have it, everybody has it. Now, uh, many of you may or may not know this, Google puts a monthly report on uh, collecting data from uh, their self-driving cars. Um, they've driven almost a million miles uh, more than a million miles, million and a half almost. Um, then uh, there is also this interesting uh, information they provide. They, they call it this, this uh, autonomous disengagement. Uh, so if you look at the chart on the right, uh, basically what it's showing is the, the uh, miles before the autonomous system disengages, mean, meaning somebody manually takes over, they're going up. That means it's driving autonomously for most of the time. And you can see that in those two uh, um, in, a, in a numerical fashion also. Um, and, and of course there are issues um, about robot ethics and, and that definitely needs to be part of the discussion. Uh, what if a, a self-driving car gets into an accident, who is to blame? Is it the car manufacturer? Is it the driver? Uh, is it uh, the software uh, person? Who, who is to blame and basically where does the liability lie? That's uh, a, a big topic these days. And uh, four states in the U.S. now allow legally uh, the autonomous uh, cars to be driven, California, Florida, ne Nevada, and Michigan. Uh, and uh, if you don't know, GEICO actually sells uh, insurance for autonomous cars. And I don't know how that works, um, so but they do. Um, then U UAVs, of course, there's a lot of confusion. FAA trying to come up with these regulations. Uh, that's just not a unique U.S. case. Canada, Australia, everybody's grappling with the same problem. So there's a lot of confusion about autonomous systems, uh, how much humans should be involved. So within IEEE, this is not with the Robotics Automation Society, but at the IEEE level, there's something called the Future Directions Committee. And as the name implies, it basically looks at 10, 15 years in the future, 
what effect technology, a particular technology would have or what kind of technologies we should be focused on. So that's exactly what that thing does. And within that, I have this, I'm chairing this new project called the Autonomous Technologies and Their Societal Impact uh, that's trying to uh, uh, measure or try to understand the impact of autonomous systems as it applies to some of the examples I showed. Uh, but it's very narrow because it's, it's autonomous systems um, and we are trying to involve not just technologies but we're also trying to involve um, um, lawyers, we're trying to involve social scientists, ethicists. Uh, it needs to be a balanced discussion. That's where we are going with this. We want it to be a balanced view as opposed to somewhat of a skewed view that we tend to get in the media these days. Uh, some of the topics that are listed, there is actually a first workshop in the series. There is going to be three. There is one in Canada in June. Um, the uh, abstract submission deadline is Monday. Uh, <laughs> as always, it's close. Uh, but we, we have some good people signed up on this and this will be an interesting uh, discussion and at the end of it we will put out, end of the effort, after the three uh, meetings in the series, we'll put out a white paper. Um, quickly, uh, this is the university I'm part of. This is a very unique university uh, in, in terms of doing humanitarian work. They do a lot of work in, in terms of women empowerment, um, in terms of uh, providing skill sets for people who are um, uh, at the bottom of the pyramid, if you will. Um, so I just wanted to do that. And then I have one more shameless plug. This is a conference uh, we are organizing at the end of the year. Uh, we have assembled a really nice set of speakers uh, from Jeff Sachs to some well-known roboticists, including my host uh, here who has graciously agreed to come. So this, uh, we hope, will be, and in fact this will be the first time, uh, a robotics automation conference is exclusively focusing on humanitarian applications, so we hope this will be a good conference. Uh, and then I'm going to conclude, uh, this is my last slide, I promise. Um, I, I want to end on somewhat of a philosophical note. Uh, there is this book uh, called Small is Beautiful, um, and I'll put the next one too. So it's uh, written by an economist, uh, Schumacher, um, Austrian. Uh, the book came out in 1973, the same year I was born. Um, and it talks about something called Buddhist economics. Um, of course, I'm a Buddhist. I, I've uh, disclosed that before, but it's a beautiful piece of uh, it's chapter four, and the book is available freely if you want to read it. And it's, it's definitely not bedtime reading, but it's a very, very nice piece of ethics type of uh, discussion. And the standard of living, quality of life discussion I talked about, it came from this. Um, um, so I, I've been very much influenced by this. I thoroughly recommend that folks read it. Uh, there is also this uh, nice uh, article written by Jeff Sachs. Uh, for people who don't know Jeff Sachs, he uh, was the architect of this uh, uh, UN's Millennium Development Goals, which now has transitioned into the so-called uh, Sustainable Development Goals. Um, so he talks about restoring virtue ethics in quest for happiness, and purely he talks to technologists. Uh, definitely worth a read, and I think we need more and more of these type of discussions to permeate the engineering space as opposed to it being purely research oriented or teaching oriented. Uh, a lot of things are happening because some universities already have uh, humanitarian engineering programs and also ethics is becoming like a core uh, course within many of the engineering programs, but we need, um, especially the younger generation, uh, needs to have a good overview of what's out there and at the same time also perhaps tailor some of their work in the future to, to benefit humanity. So I am going to stop at that note and uh, that's my last slide. Um, coming from India I have to put that one up. I, I used to be one of those people who constantly complained. Uh, so that is a quote that speaks very directly to me. Be the change you want to see in the world. So do something about it, however small. Uh, I. I, I won't say I'm not complaining, I do complain, but I've reduced. So I'll stop on that note and uh, thank you very much. Does anyone have a Wow, everybody understood everything. <laughs> Perfect. So I actually have an ethical question. <laughs> If, if you measure everything by happiness and and uh, well not everything but quality of life let's say um, it, it was an interesting dichotomy for me where you're talking about happiness 
and the definition you gave for happiness is something you can bear easily. And then you talked about sort of the negative side of the movie industry, which arguably brings happiness, <laughs> right? <laughs> you talk about Bollywood, and I'm not joking, there is a, a strong sense of that. So a lot of the communities I work with, entertainment is key. Is sure. They are released from the pressures of life. Um, so I was just wondering how you, I mean, entertainment is not necessarily in itself a sure, sure. thing. And so, so but it's less entertaining, it's mundane. I understand. Um, so the key thing is not happiness, it's alleviation of suffering, mm -hmm. which is also happiness. Mm -hmm. So that's really you taking some suffering away. Now, the movies you mentioned, right? Uh, um, Hollywood, uh, Bollywood too. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's fleeting happiness. It's not permanent happiness, right? You're gonna be there for three hours. Bollywood movies are three hours long. Uh, so you go there, you forget everything really because you just come completely engrossed in the movie, dance sequences, whatever. Uh, so you tend to forget, it's, it's fleeting happiness. You really forget for a very short amount of time, your suffering, sufferings are forgotten. So you are happy, but is it really happiness? Three hours later, nothing has changed. You're back to square one. All the problems are still there waiting for you when you get out of the theater. So it's alleviation of suffering is more important than just happiness. And also, when you, if you just want to emphasize happiness, it's fleeting happiness. It's not what I'm talking about. It's about more. And I can get philosophical about it as a Buddhist because we, this uh, fleeting happiness is, is actually the core of all the suffering because we think we want something and we think we got it, but we really don't have it. And then we want more and then it just piles on and on. So how about beyond happiness, uh, inspiration, right? So I have a four-year-old, almost five-year-old son who absolutely loves Baymax, for example. Oh, uh, loves what? Baymax, the soft robot. Oh, oh, yeah, okay, okay. Big Hero 6. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and it's inspired him at the age of four to start building machines. He builds all these machines to get his toys to get from one place to the other and has all of these different things. But Similarly, I mean, if I think about the communities I work with, I've worked with a small school for blind children in India since 2006, and when we first talked to them, they were just excited that everyone wanted to talk to them. Um, we never asked what technology can do for you because it's a meaningless question at the time. But over the decades that we work with them, now, you know, we always ask them what are new problems you would like us to try and work with you on. And, and now the teachers, they, they went from saying things like, um, you know, computers are great, we have these computers donated, what can we do with them, to I want a robot to carry my books, right? So there is inspiration and, and sort of a, an evolution of uh, what might be possible that does come also partly because of the activity. But then it also gets into the standard of living, quality of life discussion, right? If a robot is carrying your books, yes, you're going to be happy. It's alleviated your suffering of back pain, but do you really need it? Um, so, Arguably for a blind teacher. For a blind person, yes. I was talking about <laughs> the little child. Uh, okay. Yeah, yeah. The, that's. I mean, uh, if uh, uh, if it's helping a blind person and if technology is doing something good for it, that I'm, that's humanitarian for me. Um, so it's not, I mean, it's definitely alleviating suffering, right? Because blind person, by carrying the load, maybe their navigation capabilities are compromised. Let's say there's dragging and somewhere there, whatever, and then it helps them to navigate better. Um, certainly improves the quality of life. So it's not, for me, it's not standard of living and it certainly fits my uh, own view of humanitarian. So I, I, I would agree with that. Okay. Any other questions? Otherwise, we'll let our speaker go. Thank you.